So, I'm Brian White. I've seen you guys around and last year as well. Good to see you again. Um, so a couple of things I wanted to uh, uh, point out, really some, um, some of the concepts that uh, we're exploring here as the combined Arista Mojo team, um, but also um, look at some of the new features we've brought into the product over the last year. Um, and then culminating with actually, we're gonna do a, a quick demo with uh, my counterpart, Robin Jellum there. Um, so of course, you know, we've dived into quite a lot of this uh, already. Um, there's a cons there's a kind of a separation between, uh, say, the uh, uh, the switch infrastructure and the Wi-Fi infrastructure as far as uh, uh, data sets and troubleshooting and what information can be brought into that uh, that uh, that framework for either inventory, um, uh, application performance, troubleshooting, all that sort of thing, right? So that they're they're uh, they're very separate today. Even in products that tend to try to unify that. Um, they are still very separate, and the unification really comes from maybe you know, meshing together or hashing together some different views within a single uh, construct. Um, they're still very separate. Um, so, you know, obviously, you hear you hear cloud networking, cloud vendors all the time. Uh, you know, what does that actually mean? Um, and some of the early cloud vendors, it was very much focused on. This is really simple. You plug it in, it pops up. I configure something very easily, and then. Uh, and then go on with my life. Um, but that's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, cool, cool graphic, but that's, uh, that's kind of the, the point it's trying to make. But really the depth is underneath, which is using the cloud, compute, storage, all of that data sets um, to do something better, special, uh, focused on the scale, new use cases, and that sort of thing. And I think that's been the focus of Mojo um, for a few years now, and I think that's also the focus uh, that Arista brings to the table as well. I think that's that point's been, you know, hashed out pretty strongly. Um, so again, the goal being the cognitive campus. That's a term that you'll hear quite a lot uh, from Arista Mojo, um, in that you're taking that cognitive networking theory and applying that to the in entire network, wired and wireless. So um, back to specifically Wi-Fi. Right, which is one of the things that we um, deal with as Wi-Fi professionals <laughs> is a lot of times, um, uh, you know, a, an end user that's having some kind of problem, right? And part of your job is now to dig into syslogs and you know UIs and maybe CLI and try to figure out what that problem is, right? So um, and whether or not the uh, the problem manifests itself in the application or in the network itself, whatever, it's is that client happy or sad is really the end of the story here, right? And so can the network fix it or can the network figure it out, apply that logic to a, a data set and try to figure out what's going on and best case scenario, make some changes to fix that problem automatically. And there's quite a, a decent subset of problems that you can fix automatically. And some of that's uh, being flushed into the system uh, over, the, over time. So as we all know, Wi-Fi gets blamed, right? Um, it could be any one of these problems. Uh, it could be association, uh, the radius server didn't answer, um, the, the DHCP server, the scope is full. Any of those problems, it just means the users, the Wi-Fi sucks and they're not gonna bother. Well, the list it, right? is way longer than of that, course. buddy. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and it could be anything. But the funny thing about Wi-Fi is the symptom is always the same, which is it doesn't work. And it could be a certificate server puked, it could be the, you know, just any of these things, right? And so our goal was to uh, kind of say, okay, as a Wi-Fi administrator that's overloaded with everything that they need to do, the network, the Wi-Fi network especially, knows exactly what's going on. It knows that the radius server didn't answer. It knows that the client didn't get an IP address. It knows that the DNS server has 300 millisecond latency. So why not instrument that and push that up to the top in a UI? to where the administrator logs in and they immediately go, okay, is this a Wi-Fi problem or is it not a Wi-Fi problem? Or maybe I have no problems at all and the UI should validate that for you, which is really where the whole concept of, yeah, the whole concept of cognitive Wi-Fi. And so we've built a lot of our UI to very quickly and easily give you the information you need to assess very fast uh, very, very quickly, uh, is this a wireless problem or is it not? Or are my, customer, my, my clients healthy? Or if they're not, then I dig down a little further. So this is another uh, uh, copy of the slide that Murthy had. But the 
he, um, and, and here's your, this actually showed through, so we got it covered. Um, yeah, so this is, you know, a lot of the things that you're collecting in order to uh, make these decisions, make these uh, determining factors about whether or not the, uh, um, uh, the, the end user experience, you're trying to infer the end user experience by a lot of these, te these techniques. And, um, and, and of course, we bring that up through the UI. So one of the examples, the client journey here, uh, in this particular example, there's uh, 3,386 clients. Sorry. There's a question from yep. Twitter saying uh, they're wondering if you guys will be able to drill down and look at the issues that go as far deep as the uh, like WLAN client drivers. So client drivers are interesting, and that's a tough one, because the client driver, you cannot get information specifically about the client driver from the infrastructure. You can get things like, is this, you know, is it Windows 10? Is it iOS 9? What's the, you know, the, the Mac OUI? But as far as the driver version, you really need an agent on the machine to get that information. So there's been a lot of talk in the industry. I've had many discussions with various people about it is at some point, if you have an MDM involved, if you have some software on the laptop that can pull some of this information, sometimes it can be a VPN client, sometimes it can be you know, any, any host of, of piece of software, can then report that driver version to the infrastructure. That's yet another data point that you can use within cognitive Wi-Fi to do that. Um, I don't think that connection has been made yet. And because the challenge is, who wants to load a client on every one of their, their, their laptops? Nobody um, wants that, but I do want that functionality. Exactly. <laughs> oh my, everybody's, yeah. everybody's wanted it, but the only way to get it really is that is, is some, some piece of software on the device that's reporting that to the infrastructure. And that's a tough call. But, um, you know, we have talked a lot about, you know, uh, partnering with MDM vendors and other software vendors that might have already a presence on the laptop to, to, to do that, right? Have you thought of maybe this is, might be completely off base and not working, whereas you're going ahead and validating everything on the AP, that you know what I mean, you figured out, okay, DHCP's working, DNS is working, other clients are working, it's <coughs> very and you're gathering data, it's like, well, you know it's a Windows 10 machine, but all my Apple machines are working perfectly. You can pinpoint it. You can't specifically say it's a driver, but that's you right. can at least. That's be like, exactly what this is. Yeah, that's exactly what that's for. Which is which is as good as we can possibly get without a, to elevate that as a possible issue without actually knowing the driver version, okay. right? So, to talk that through, and that was a really good question. To talk that through, we start with three thousand three hundred eighty-six clients. As of right here, we've got authentication. Now, what was covered under authentication? Incorrect pre-shared key. Radius server didn't answer, um, radius timeout, that sort of thing, all gets pushed right there. So there are 18 clients that failed to authenticate for some reason. Now, if I moused over that, that would pop up a little window to say these are the reasons why. Usually network is DNS issues or DHCP issues or so on. Preach it, brother. Yeah, so, so this, this gets added to the number of clients out of the 3,386, 3,355, 31 have problems. So all I did this particular part right here is the very first thing you see when you log in. And immediately, boom, your entire network. Now, in the demo, we'll sh you know, show there's a folder structure over here so I can go all into my network or all my high schools or all my places in Washington State. You know, I, can, I can change this view depending on which folder I'm looking at. But the goal is, again, I logged into my system and I immediately see I have 31 clients that may be having an issue. I mouse over, I click, this is what comes up next, which is the, the list of clients that have issues. And they may have all kinds of different issues. This guy, radius authentication failure. This guy, incorrect PSK. And I can click on any one of these clients and bring up a connection log, which immediately has an automatic packet capture, which we'll get to in a bit. But the assessment of this group of clients, we're there to pull out those common pieces of information like you know, the majority of these guys are Windows 10. Um, yesterday, they were, no Windows clients had a problem, you know, so maybe there's a difference there. And then breakdown of, Patch are they all AC happen. or, you know, whatever, right? So this is the goal is to elevate that to the top, make it really easy. Quick question, what is clicking on generate intelligent view? What is that? Yeah, okay, so different? in this view, that right there shouldn't be there. I apologize, I had a, I had a cover <laughs> over it. Um, that is actually in another part of the UI, which okay. I'll show. It's, okay. it, that is actually what we're calling the inference engine, um, which will actually tell you a little more about what the possible problem is. So here's a performance dashboard. So we actually have connectivity dashboards, which is what you saw before. Same kind of process to the performance side of the house, which is 
even though I might be completely on the network and I'm in that green, that 3300 green section, I might still have performance issues. But for the, from the connectivity standpoint, I'm totally good. In the performance dashboard, this is all about things like sticky client, low RSSI, low data rate, that sort of thing. Then from there, there's also the uh, application. Um, no, this doesn't go backwards. There it does. The, uh, the application dashboards. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. This is actually a lot what Murthy was talking about, but this is the view, which we're called you know, with uh, um, uh, the, uh, the root cause analysis and the inference engine. But the result of that is sort of this, right? So we'll look at this. This is the short out look for root cause. This is where this is now in the performance dashboard. And you come up with these automated recommendations, right? Which is basically crunching the data and saying, this is the problem. And actually, we had a real time, uh, a real example in one of our offices. Um, I, for, I forgot the story a lot, but it, apparently they were having some performance issues in that particular area. And um, it's, you know, obviously, you know, as a Wi Fi vendor, you have a lot of APs around, and it can sometimes cause problems, right? And um, yeah, there was just way too many uh, test APs in that area. They were all contending for a particular channel. And actually, this actually you know, popped up really nicely and just said, you know, hey, this was going on. There's way too many APs in that channel right there. So. Um, just some feedback. One, I love the, the openness, the cleanness mm. of the, the interface. Font, please say it. Uh, the font specifically caught me. So thank you. That was really good. Did you have anything to do with the font choice? <laughs> but how does this how does this play out on smaller interfaces, laptops, ha handhelds rather yeah. than big screens? So there's a couple things. Um, uh, it it does seem to work really well on smaller resolution uh, screens. Um, I have seen it be the other way, which is on a really high res screen. There's a lot of white space, and I think that's that's something that we'll we'll be messing with. The other side about it in small mobile devices is we actually have an entire UI that is uh, specific and engineered for a mobile device. It's we call it Nano, but it's a lot of this sort of thing. It's it's uh, it needs to catch up on some of the features, but it is a small uh, so form have, factor. It, so when you, you can get do it with that with device, it. it knows to use that instead. Uh, it, it's actually um, uh, you, it's another URL, basically. It's another app. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a web app that's pointing to the same data set and back end, right? Yeah. But you can configure. You can configure captive portals, change SSIDs. You can do a lot of stuff. And we have way, customers that are using that as the entire basis of their offering from a managed service perspective, and their customers don't even use this. So, By the way, options. since you're on that, what is the font? Excuse me? What is the font? Oh, graphic. Also my favorite. Yes. Graphic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's why Mitch has been smiling over there. He's just there's, been like, there's graphic, yeah. there's graphic light, there's graphic ultralight. A lot of our stuff is ultralight, but there's some light in there too. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Font geeks unite. So, all right. Um, we, we also do this for network usage. There's some network usage displays. This is also in the performance dashboard where it breaks down um, all the clients, the, uh, the uplink data, downlink data and the applications and the, and the data here. Fun story here. I'm in the United Kingdom going to talk to a partner whom we're hoping to resell our product. Guy's sitting behind the desk, you know? And he's not a believer. I don't know, it's not this, and you, I wanna know how you, I change your application awareness because I think you're mistagging applications. Fair enough, bugs sometimes happen. Um, let's take a look, we go look at it. And the top application for their entire network was ICMP. So he says, all of my, uh, all of my teams who manage all the servers, they do manage service and stuff, they, everything's Citrix. And you are misclassifying Citrix as ICMP. So this is a problem. I said, all right, we'll take a look at it. We do a packet capture, which of course, obviously, you can do packet capture here. You can do it per location, per AP, all that sort of thing. We do a packet capture. And just to set the stage, when you looked at the list of applications, it was like, you know, HTTP, YouTube, Facebook, ICMP. I mean, it was just across the screen. It was, you know, in the last hour, it was multiple gigs. Um, we got the packet capture and looked at it. And then, granted, this is a, an evaluation. Get the packet capture, look at it. All the ICMP is real. They had the flag set on their Cisco router that every packet, every device out there hitting its default gateway, it would respond with an ICMP. So it was like 47% of their entire 
internal network bandwidth was just being taken up by these ICMP packets going everywhere. They didn't realize that before that? <laughs> the network was crap? They didn't. Mr. <laughs> sitting across the table like this had no idea, didn't realize it, and just the evaluation <laughs> of our product where it was showing this sort of stuff illuminated that issue. And Very nice. It was interesting. Very nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> kind of funny. So again, another view of the video uh, a QOE. And this is like a design language. You'll see this in various parts of our product where, uh, where things are displayed in this way. Very simple. How's Skype doing? Great. One client, maybe there's no problem there, whatever. It's very straightforward. And we have been working to train additional applications. So this will move beyond video, voice and video. Um, we figured these were the most important. You know, um, People doing uh, link and Skype for business type deployments are always complaining about everything about it. So, so quick question. Yeah. It's maybe amateur, but when I look at this and I see 21, 35, 1, 18, 5, respectively, down the street, are we saying 20 sessions, 20 users, 20 devices? 20, de 20 sorry. 20 users, devices, okay. are using Skype. Okay, it's it's just a, it was ambiguous for yeah. somebody that's not familiar with the platform. So clients, um, maybe some additional verbiage or wordage might help. Yeah, fair enough. So again, uh, these are some um, from views from some of the upcoming software that we're working on. Uh, again, obviously, this is very much not a real data stream <laughs> because it's a lot of problems, right? But the goal is to say over time, square out how many clients are using the application and what the poor application experiences versus the, versus the green, which would be the good experience. And again, the goal is just to tell you, you know, is this happening or not? And then be able to drill down low, uh, drill down into it. And this is, again, another drill down, Hangouts, very poor, Skype, you know, getting better. And this is this particular network usage on this single AP. So again, these are just different displays to try to uh, put forth the fact of, you know, how's the network doing? Again, you're inferring that end user experience. So, You've heard a lot of vendors talk about three radio APs. Um, Motorola started this years ago, 2008, something, when they had a, a built-in uh, scanning radio for this. A lot of other vendors have picked it up. Um, we are a firm believer in this. And a couple years ago, probably three years ago now, we had made a firm choice to say, we are doing three radio and really betting on it hard. A couple reasons for that. Um, I, I used to work for other vendors, right? And um, one of the things you would do is have two radios and an AP. That radio's whole job really is to serve clients. So you're doing periodic off-channel scanning. I'm going to say uh, every 10 seconds, I'm going to go off-channel and scan for 110 milliseconds and then come back. If my job is to scan for, uh, if my job is to serve clients, I can't go off-channel and scan that often. Usually it's about 10 seconds. Usually it's configurable, but most people leave it as default. For me to do that every 10 seconds, how long does that take me to get through 36 channels of 5 gigahertz? Hey, a long time, right? So both from a security perspective, meaning that if I'm only, if I'm scanning through the entire you know, channel every six minutes, there's a lot of security uh, events that I might miss. Maybe client presence I might miss because again, clients aren't beaconing, so they're not transmitting all the time and I might miss them. So it might take me two or three or four times on that channel to go catch the fact that that client is present, if they're unassociated, of course. From a security perspective, that's an issue, right? As with a dedicated radio, I get that full scan, 3.6 seconds. When I have that much data, I'm not only looking at this from a security perspective, I'm looking at it from an RF health perspective, using that to make uh, close to real-time decisions on what the RF uh, environment should look like. Um, and then we start to think, okay, great. Now we've got this third radio sitting in the AP. What else can you do with it? This is what started on the let's build in the fact that it can be it can simulate a client associate even with dot one x to a neighboring ap and do some testing so again we configure these tests and you can actually schedule these tests you can automate these tests you can say if you're doing a retail deployment every morning at 7 a.m two hours before the store opens i've sent a test to say can i associate can i authenticate do i get an ip can i talk to the gateway do a dns work and i can say uh, ping tests, I can put in uh, hosts to ping and get, you know, do reachability tests. As well, just this uh, past, uh, three months ago, I think, we added a voice simulation. So you can have the system send a bunch of small packets that look like voice and say, um, 
run a voice simulated voice call for 10 minutes and then come back and then the results of the test look like this where everything is green I can I can drill down so the throughput test I actually drilled down here's my throughput test for that particular link from the AP out the WAN 50 megabits per second great um, if I had a voice test in here this would show me MOS score jitter latency that sort of thing and again this is an automated test these tests are archived so I can go through um, uh, I basically do a, uh, a, a real-time troubleshooting session on my network every day without me having to do it, nor rely on my users for that information as well. So let's use the retail store as an example. This happened at seven, I got an alarm that said, you know, this was a problem. I have a two hour head start before the first of the day so that they know that they can do credit card transactions that day. That's real money, right? So this stuff's pretty important. Uh, another piece of it is when I talked about once the system realizes that there's a failure, um, there's, a, there's a, a ring buffer in the AP, right? And so once there's a, a, a possible issue where there's, there's a, that the AP needs to be aware of, the ring buffer kicks in um, to start a packet trace. It goes back in time just a little bit for that. And then you, the log you get is basic, sorry, hit the wrong button. The log you get is this basic, this client, and here's all my connection logs. So a couple of things. I can actually do live connection logs now, right? So I click on this, I can do a live connection log and do troubleshooting and it's live event. And I can archive that off if I want. I can save it in a directory or a repository here. You can go reference that. But let's say this user, either you caught it because you logged into the system or you caught it because they called you three days later. And you're like, ah, three days later, I wish I had a packet capture of that. That situation no longer exists. Well, the system caught it and here's your packet capture. So when you click this, this packet capture is actually stored on the cloud and it loads uh, Mojo packets. Now, if you guys may or maybe not familiar with Mojo packets, um, it is actually a piece of software on the cloud. You guys can sign up for it and use it and upload your own PCAPs to it, but it's also the basis for this automated packet capture analysis. So it's taken the PCAPs and instead of looking at it like Wireshark, which Wireshark's decent and good, but <coughs> filtering out certain clients or just, it's, it's kind of a pain in that regard. This is all done in a UI. So I can click any one of these points, I can zoom in, I can move in and out. If I do a mass packet capture, I can just say, here's the 25 clients in this capture, I'm gonna click on this one client. It just does it all in a, in a graphic perspective. So a quick uh, question on this. Yep. Um, and again, I know it's early, but we still have to ask, do you anticipate this being carried over to the Arista side? Oh, uh, well, I, say, I will say there's nothing preventing this tool as is from reading a PCAP from anywhere. Or does like you can take a PCAP that you had from three years ago and upload this and it'll do the same graphic. It'll, it'll tell you, you know, how many clients are in this. It'll look at what possible issues are in there and it'll do all this stuff for you. Or does EOS have something similar to this? You can do a packet capture. So my, so my point with that is if EOS has a way to get a packet capture yeah, into this, and it's then pretty easy to, to put them together. But I don't think we've talked too much about that yet. It's four weeks, so. Yeah. <laughs> we absolutely have the ability in EOS to capture packet traces. Uh, you can create access to sentries, redirect packets of software, run TCP dump right on a switch, store PCAP files in a switch, and then uploading them to Mojo Packet is uh, okay. a small additional step. Yeah, so maybe my question should be turned into a comment, and it would be nice if this didn't get lost in the sausage. Appreciate it. <laughs> yep, absolutely. No, I, yeah, I've always, I've always loved this. I think this is having someone with responsibility over networks that know sometimes they need packet captures, but they don't get in Wireshark every day. They're not a real expert so they can kind of fumble around with it. A tool like this just makes it so easy. And the other thing that we, we, we push with this is remember, since this is all on the cloud, you have this concept of collaborative troubleshooting, right? Because you, just, you can create a link and just send this link to the 10 people on your team. One guy's in Sydney, one guy's in London, one guy's in, you know, all over the place. And, and they, you can all look at it at the same time, right? And, and annotate. So it's a, it's a really interesting tool. And I, I agree with you. That's uh, something we should definitely so continue with. If you guys are keeping the tool, could we possibly raise the max upload? <laughs> By the way, so that, that is because you are not a, that is the free version. Okay. When you're a Mojo customer, I believe it's a gig. Oh. oh. So it's 
quite high. Never mind. I'm yeah. With that. So, so <laughs> if, if you are actually a customer of the Wi-Fi stuff, it's it's bigger. Okay. Um, and it is something that we can change. So, I, I like this whole view of what what the Mojo dashboard provides, and I think when you integrate the Arista side, troubleshooting the full path, including going down to, all right, I have a lot of clients that can't access this website for some reason. Is that wireless or is that because something in the routing table doesn't show that like, it's being black holed? Like, I, I, think, I see that forming in the future, but the one thing that I couldn't see, because I'm not very familiar with the Arista product line because you're talking about campus, do you have any switches that support PoE? We, we announced the campus spine. We, we have a gig E switch. We don't have a PoE switch today. And just kind of back to the topic of integration, um, we, we architecturally, I think you got the sense from Ken, we're going to federate and architecturally integrate very tightly. I think there's a point about productization roadmap we specifically didn't address today. So I hope you all come back and, and we'll try to get more granular on when we roll out the different pieces integration and talk about interoperating with PoE and that. that. Okay. We have AC adapters on our price list, so. <laughs> <laughs>
In my case, it's completely configurable, flexible to do whatever you want. You want one SSID to go in the big core, fine. You want another to go into the local switch, fine. If I want to do local bridging, fine. And last year, these two boxes were really x86 class server boxes that we called the multi-service platform. Um, as we're putting the companies together, one of the things to support is this will then be tunneled into any EOS box. And if you think about EOS being an operating system that can run on any switch hardware that Arista sells, it effectively means the tunnel endpoint from this SSID can be any one of those locations. And I have complete freedom to uh, engineer the, the wireless data path within my network however way I see fit, completely independent of a controller location, for example. So uh, the, the other uh, big feature within Mojo is everything is API, right? So our, ent our entire back end, everything, our uh, uh, different services, whether it's SSO, whether it's the guest system, whether it's Canvas, which is our captive portal design tool, these are all web apps that actually uh, interface in with the main surface that's interfa interfacing with the access points. So all of these services uh, run inside of our cloud. And every one of them can, be, uh, can have a, uh, an interface with, uh, via API um, to other systems. We integrate with uh, loyalty systems, CRMs. Um, sometimes when our managed service providers, we have a guy on a truck that pulls out an access point, they don't know which customer it applies to. So there's a mobile app that's another you know, app that's running to the API where they can scan the, the, uh, the MAC address, assign it to a customer record, and then go on with their day. So all that stuff's built into the system. Sorry. There's a question from Twitter. Um, can you decide whether or not to tunnel via radius attributes so it can be a policy decision? Cannot currently. Um, well, that has come up a couple times. Um, one of the challenges with that was, would be that for dot one x, it makes a lot of sense. For guest and open traffic, not so much. Because it's hard to make a VLAN change and decision whether or not you're tunneling or not if you're not actually going to do a media disconnect or a, or a dot one x COA. So um, I think that use case is, is fairly rare, but it, is, it has come up in discussion. <clears throat> uh, as mentioned before, the other thing as far as these APIs go is uh, we have been, earlier this year, uh, started work on open config, having all, all this stuff be configured uh, and streamed via the open config framework. I think that really matched with the, uh, uh, the Arista um, uh, kind of concept as well as they're big fans of open config. I think that, that really is a, is a key point as different operators and larger customers want to take advantage of that sort of thing. Um, so one other kind of anecdotal thing. Uh, there's a large customer uh, that we have. Uh, remember that um, um, uh, the client journey where I had 3,000 clients up there? Their number is above 30,000. And so uh, that kind of gives you an idea of how large their network is. I want to say they're 8,000 APs, something in that ballpark. Um, they don't use our UI at all, at all. They use a provisioning tool to match the access point that they're deploying to the particular location. And then they built their own MDM, for lack of a better word. They're in the healthcare. And uh, they have a lot of uh, devices that do a healthcare function. And the UI that they use to operate the entire network is, uh, is something that they've built. And like uh, three quarters, the screen's cut in, uh, in quarters. Three quarters of it is their stuff. And then in the bottom corner is actually all the Wi-Fi information that's all pulled via API to us. And they, they don't even look at our UI. Kind of an interesting use case. Yeah, um, that's, that's but, the benefit. I like the UI. <laughs> totally. I mean, but in, but in their case, there's some, there's some uh, if you want to do some specific automations, some specific integration with your own CRM or, or uh, you know, customer, interfa or customer um, uh, management interface, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. So it's, they, it's they, bought, they bought based on hardware and the API flexibility. Exactly. And the scale. Okay. And the fact that we can scale that many APs and have this... You know, all work to that to that end. Um, our largest customer, 170,000 APs in production, something like that. Third ballpark. They add 3,000 a week, 2,500, 3,000 a week. Largest customer, and they do a lot of API, a lot of provisioning. What vertical is that? Uh, telco. Okay. Retail store. No, telco. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we really are encouraging customers to adopt the API. Um, we created this API portal 
one of the things that the kind of the example I always give, you know, a lot of vendors have APIs, right? But if I gave you a dictionary of English words and I laid it on the table and thud and said, okay, now create some sentences, where would you start, right? So, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of APIs need that sort of uh, documentation development work. So we created a portal where there's example code, um, drill downs on what exactly the API calls do, explaining what they, what they all mean, because some of them are internal. This, you know, how we build our own UI is really interfacing to the API. So this is actually in. You guys remember last year we did the uh, Alexa demo where we had the voice command bring back a bunch of things, right? So anyway, that's out there. And uh, again, to sum up, uh, we believe this is architected for large enterprise um, customers. Uh, one thing I didn't point out, we pretty much did a lot of this, but uh, the security piece. Like if you're a, a cloud vendor and you're going to a financial or an insurance company and you say, hey, we want to take over your Wi-Fi network, and it's cloud-based, I don't want any of that. I, I don't trust whether it's secure or not. Um, we actually go through... Um, the uh, SSA 16 SOC 2 and FIPS common criteria and ISO 2701 really governs how it's run in the cloud, who has access to it, what security parameters are there, how audits happen, automated um, uh, threat analysis and everything in, in the cloud. Um, we go through that and it's, it's, it's painful, it's hard, but we do it because we believe our enterprise customers demand that of us and they would demand that of, of themselves. Other vendors may say SSA 16, but it's really it's the SOC 2 that's important. Oh, we got another one. Yep. So on your uh, document documentation pages that you were just talking about, mm -hmm. do they have code snippets that can be used? I believe so, yes. Okay. Yeah. Example codes for various things. And we would love, actually, if people would develop more of that code and even share it with other people. We've talked to other, peop other vendors about um, having that sort of uh, connection with using the API. Some other vendor or company wants to share what they've done with the API in a public space. It's one of the goals of that as well. So again, to reiterate, uh, kind of touched on a lot of things, but uh, you know, really the goal is to take a lot of what we're doing, adapt this wired wireless, and this is termed as the cognitive campus. Robin, you want to take over? I'm a special guest today. Um, so you Client journey, Brian just showed you that. This is pretty basic stuff. Uh, if I go over to the performance dashboard, Brian also showed you this. Um, here we're showing, again, the baseline, showing you what's going on. We can vary this greatly so we can look at the back, what's going on with the, the last week. We can see here something happened, um, something really bad is happening over this network over the last week or so, or the last couple days, so we can drill down in on that. But the, the whole point of the UI is I can see a lot of stuff. There's tons of stuff. We collect tons and tons and tons of data. Who cares? Why, why am I going to the UI? What we found out was that when we launched this UI, we were tracking it very closely because we were really proud of it. We were tracking it, and we noticed the number of people that are using the UI was decreasing and decreasing and de decreasing. It was like, What's going on? People hate the UI. So we called them up and they said, well, we don't need to go in your UI. It, everything is working. You know, we, we can spend much less time in the UI because we can troubleshoot much more quickly. And that's what this whole UI is about. Coming in the UI, you see things up front in your face. You don't have to go drill down on things. You don't have to have a lot of knowledge. And that's kind of our whole goal here is to be able to do things simply and quickly and navigate this very quickly. I don't have to come up with what What's the problem? What, what, what problem scenario do I have to think of? What question do I have to ask to figure this out? It shows you up front. So here, for example, I've got, I've got a retry rate. 57 clients are having a high retry rate. Actually, I can drill down. This is one of the beauties of our system is the hierarchy is very simple to navigate. If I wanted to go look at, see, somebody calls up from Santa Clara and saying they're having a problem. So I can click on that. I click on retry rate. I drill down into it, and it, it shows me which users, what kind of, where they are, uh, which access point they're on, what protocol they're using. Um, and then here's the little robot. And this is where our inference engine comes in. We can click on that, and this is in beta. It takes a little time, because it's taking all the data that's in the cloud, and it's munging this data together to come up with a root cause analysis and, what, and directions on what to do with this. So it takes a little while to do, it takes a few seconds. We click on that, and it shows us that 
Um, this location, Santa Clara, some people affected the, the root cause is um, high contention and low SSR. I can click on that, get a little bit more detail, I can see the number of clients here, but then I can go in over here, see a little bit more information, and here I can see not only the, the root cause, but the recommendations on what to solve in order of importance. So this is taking a lot of this, and th this is again in beta, we're still fine tuning how this works. Um, but this is taking a lot of domain knowledge, putting it in the network, so you can have your high value assets, you guys, not spend your time doing all the troubleshooting, because we can do, because you already know this stuff. This stuff is pretty, pretty well known in the industry. We can build this into an intelligent system to give you the answers very quickly, very simply. Uh, some of the other things I want to show you. So that's the inference engine. Um, in, in, sorry, I've got some things queued up here. Um, let's go back. Uh, the other thing that you've seen a couple times, this is the application uh, dashboard. Again, these are five machine learning models that are tuned for application, right? Each application has slightly different characteristics about uh, the type of codec they use, the type of jitter they allow, those sorts of things. So we've built machine learning models on this. We've trained these machine learning models with our massive data sets in the cloud, but the machine learning model gets used locally, right? On the, uh, on the access point or in the cloud, but you don't have to have this massive cloud compute to run the machine learning model. You need the massive cloud to train the model. So here, showing the number of users that are having a problem, if I click on this, I can actually go and see same sorts of things. What protocol they're using, where they're located. And in this case, it's saying they're having a problem, but it's a wired side problem. Because it's an access point, it's connecting the wired and the wireless, we can tell if it's a wireless problem or a wired problem. That cuts your troubleshooting time in half, right there. You're having a, you're having a, a voice over IP problem because of some wired side problem. And hopefully with Arista, and I'm leaning forward here a little bit, but Arista's got a lot of the knowledge on the wired side problem. So Hopefully next year, by this time, we'll have a solution that'll show you exactly where on the network that where the problem is. Um, and I think the other thing that you, Brian showed you that is really cool is, and he mentioned, is the client connectivity test using the third radio. To me, this is really, really powerful. I, I came from a voice over IP over Wi-Fi world, so I was always troubleshooting other people's networks because my application, just like they said Wi-Fi work didn't, didn't work, Wi-Fi was a problem the voice application was the problem, right? So this would have saved me hours and hours of time around, the, I used to travel around the world with the sniffer trying to reproduce problems. This tool right here, running the client application test on the third radio would have saved me travel time, would have saved me hours of walking around trying to solve a problem. Uh, the voice over IP test here specifically is using a PJ stip stack on the AP, sending RTP-like packets um, to an AP, looping them back, and coming up with a MOS score that tells you what the MOS score uh, was between those two APs in the air. That's really, really powerful. So quick question, none of this is additional licensing or no. anything? Everything you've seen, everything Mojo has is one license. Right. And then I think Brian also showed you that the throughput test, I think this is also really powerful because it does throughput tests, UDP, TCP, over Wi-Fi upstream and downstream and does throughput tests to the internet. So you can tell what your, your, the, the test, the speed is from the AP to the internet on any AP at any time with a right click. Very, very simple. Again, the, the beauty of the UI is figuring out things very quickly and where we can, giving you the answer before you even have to look for it. And when we go forward, where we can, solving the problem for you so you don't even have to know about it. Yeah. What kind of tests do you support now, and are you planning to add more tests? We're always looking for more tests. The, the, the tests we support now, I'm showing you them all here. I mean, it's re, this is called the client connectivity test, and it goes through everything a client would. The, the third radio is a client, a two-by-two two client, so it's connecting to a neighboring AP as a two-by-two two client. Um, it goes through everything you see here, DHCP, DNS, it checks all those things, gives you response times. It has an application test. Right now it's a ping test, um, but you can look at the application test and we have common application types in there. So it'll ping those servers. Um, going forward, I probably shouldn't say this because I was speaking a little out of turn, we'll put more application level testing in there. Um, we're always open, so if you have other tests that you think are valuable, 
love to hear it because I we're perf. always looking to add value. iPerf. iPerf. What, what specifically about iPerf are you interested in? Well, so obviously, I mean, the, it's actually uh, in contrast to just the, the internet throughput test. Because obviously, there, there's a lot of people when we're troubleshooting, you hear, well, I did an internet speed test. Well, I don't want to hear that. Sure. I'd rather see the real throughput through my network, not necessarily out to some speed test server that I have no control over. So you, you want an internet, you want a, a speed test to something on the network. Correct. Not to the internet. Correct. But on, on the wired side. Yes. Right. Yep. Because this, this already includes the Wi-Fi side. OK. Yeah, there's the Wi-Fi. But yeah, like okay. say, I mean, just to have something in your data center or something that you have where you okay. can run some kind of throughput so test. Fair enough. Some raw throughput test just to get a good idea, this hey, am I having nice a problem with the cloud. application that's down in my data center or what have you? But yeah, that would be, that'd be helpful. OK. Yeah, that would be nice with integrating with the ERISA side, actually seeing where on your network your throughput tanks. A absolutely. You gotta draw it out on a map, right? It, within your dashboard. Once we integrate that, sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> we're just making work. Um, yeah, 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 we're not being demanding at all, are we? <laughs> <laughs> making work. Um, yeah. I've, I've got no time, I'm already out of time. Um, but do you have any other questions? If you have any questions or comments, you can always send them to me. It's Robin Jellum at, a, or our Robin J at arista.com. Um, the other thing is, if you have any feedback, I know a lot of you have Mojo accounts. If you haven't gone to look at them recently, I suggest you do that. We're adding stuff all the time. Um, and I, I've checked some of these things. I think some of the new things you haven't seen, so I'll make sure you get them enabled. So when you go in, you'll see some of the new stuff.